Good afternoon. The topic of this panel is uh, the capital markets and uh, welcome James and Kate and Laura. Um, it's, been, it's been quite a year. This is the same panel we had last year just about this time and uh, good to see you all again. Um, it's been a wild year for capital markets. We've had um, capital from all over the world chasing um, the science of biotech and it's been quite a ride for that whole industry. And I guess what we want to talk about today is, um, is this an industry where the science is chasing, where, where biotech, the capital is chasing the science, is this an industry where the science is chasing the capital? And maybe we can do a little bit of the progress and the setbacks that we've had since we met um, last year. Um, and Kate, I know you have a couple slides maybe uh, for an introduction, but I thought maybe we would start with just a minute or two um, introducing ourselves and, um, and, then, and then we can get into it. So let's go left to right, James. Sure, I'm happy to start off. Thanks, Dennis. Um, so my name is James Pyre. I uh, run a group called Cambrian Biopharma that is actually still mostly in stealth mode, but it, we're taking a multi-asset approach to this aging biology space. So the idea is that individual drug development programs are quite hard. So you have to take an awful lot of shots on goal in order to uh, get the one, two, or three that will eventually turn into approved drugs. And that the future of research stage uh, biotech R&D companies is, is you know, having an organization that can afford to take a sufficient number of, of shots on goal so that investors from very different risk pockets, which is something we can get into a bit later, both expert biotech investors like some that we have on this panel, as well as uh, folks that are less confident but interested in the biotech field can still participate in an entity like this because the risk is way lower when you take a, an appropriate diversity um, approach. And, and Chris, welcome to the panel. And we were just starting off by taking a minute or two and introducing ourselves. Maybe you want to go next. Yes, thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, my name is Christopher Burke. I'm a medical doctor by training. Um, since a young age, I've been fascinated by uh, the aging process and uh, new biotechnologies. So made for my uh, passion uh, a little bit my uh, occupation. Um, so I'm a biotech consultant. I'm uh, uh, also still a researcher at the University of Brussels into aging and new technologies. I'm a faculty member of Singularity University Benelux in Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg about new developments in the biotech uh, field and the future of medicine. Uh, and I'm a partner at Longevity Vision Fund, which is a $100 million fund that invests in two new technologies um, to address aging and aging related uh, diseases. So very happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks. And Laura? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Laura, partner and founder of Longevity Fund. So we're the first uh, venture fund to invest in the longevity space. Um, we've uh, been part of most of the major deals um, in the space uh, sort of historically. And um, currently, our focus is on founders and supporting individuals to start great companies. Um, so we, we don't start companies ourselves. We help um, really, really great individuals a few per year start um, what we use as the best companies um, kind of to, to try and the longevity thesis. OK. Kate, yes. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be back. Uh, and what a year it has been. So uh, I'm a managing partner uh, at Deep Knowledge Group. And uh, if uh, you guys remember, we have a comprehensive approach uh, to investing because we have several arms with our, within our group, including uh, Venture Arm. Uh, the grandfather entity here is uh, Deep Knowledge uh, Ventures, and we started approximately around uh, 2013. Uh, we're raising a new fund now that's called Longevity Capital. Our uh, venture arm is supported by our analytical subsidiaries such as Agent Analytics Agency and Deep Knowledge Analytics. Last year, if you remember, we presented uh, an analytical report in uh, partnership with Metabicity, uh, which analyzed uh, the situation in the United States uh, as it relates to Metabicity and longevity. And in addition to all of that, we also participate in a number of um, nonprofit uh, longevity initiatives, and we've collaborated with United Nations, WHO, Aging Research at King's, and a number of other uh, organizations. And I'll be happy to elaborate uh, today as to what we were up to uh, in the past 12 months. Nice to be back. Thanks. And maybe we can kick this off kind of looking at the macro level from, from where we were a year ago. Um, how, have, how, how do you all see the, um, 
industry changing in terms of um, the ability to invest in the industry? What's changed since we've been here last since last year? And I, I guess I'll, I'll throw these questions open to anybody that wants to take a shot at them. Laura, yeah, I, Laura go ahead. I, jump in really quick. Um, I just want to say, as an investor who mostly focuses on first-time entrepreneurs taking a first shot in the industry, and the major challenge is turning academics into fast-moving entrepreneurs, the biggest change has been the growth rate of the companies is basically, it's like if you're watching a little E. coli medium, um, the growth rate of doubling time has like um, increased about 2x in terms of like how fast people are used to moving. I think the pandemic kicked a lot of people into gear and gave them a sense of progress that's pretty unparalleled. And we've seen companies grow um, both scientifically and from a personal perspective and just like along every metric you consider actually like just about twice as fast this year as like ever before. So I think in a weird way for like my small subset of the ecosystem, it's dramatically accelerated um, the rate of progress. Um, maybe not sustainably, but like empirically this year, it's been very, very interesting. Thanks. Yeah, I, I would I would chime in on this uh, to add not only are, are things moving faster at the company building stage, uh, I think that in part this is catalyzed by the shift that COVID has made in, well, I don't know if it's just COVID responsible for this, but there has been this enormous uptick, mostly COVID related, in the process of drug development. Never before have so many articles about phase one and phase two trials been on the front page of the New York Times, right? And an effect of this has been to pull so many investors, sophisticated investors from other fields, retail investors into the biotech space. Mm -hmm. And and as a result, there's been this enormous boom in IPOs in the biotech field, which I see as a really positive thing for the industry, a diversification of the types of folks that can that will be, you know, putting money behind R and D projects. Um, and the next year or so will be a really fascinating time because when money from these types of investors pours into a space like this, it will always go, in my experience, one of two ways. Either this is part of a, a sustained shift into, uh, like of, a, of an industry that is becoming more and more professionalized out of the specialist pockets of VCs of like specific biotech VCs and into this broader retail market or as well as, you know, general financial institutional capital. Or we could find out that many of these groups that are moving into the IPO markets are making bets on drugs that are ultimately going to fail. The experts in the space are going to cash out, make enormous profits, and a lot of the retail investors will be left holding the tab and the, the whole ecosystem will like recontract. So we're in this boom time right now. I think this is driven by by a you know, diversification of the types of investors that are coming into the space. And what this means for us as a field, as like a geroscience field, right? This is kind of broad level biotech. As a geroscience field, we are even more vulnerable to the contraction that may happen, right? Because this geroscience field is new. And so a lot of my focus and thinking has been, how do we make sure that we as an industry don't get too swept up in the hype and get too excited about, you know, ramping valuation super high, jumping too quickly into public markets, jumping too quickly into like giant mega rounds and instead uh, create assets that have sustained, you know, bubble resistant value. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I think also, of course, with COVID, it uh, made everyone realize how important it is to, add, uh, to address aging, because aging uh, is, in fact, uh, uh, the biggest risk factor of dying of COVID, of becoming very ill, uh, or mainly elderly people uh, who really suffer the most from uh, this epidemic. So, uh, yeah, more and more people start to realize we need to rejuvenate uh, the immune system uh, because uh, to, to drastically reduce the risk of, of these people dying. Um, uh, of course, if you rejuvenate the immune system, uh, that would also entail probably rejuvenating the whole body. So I uh, see more and more this realization that if you want, uh, or COVID was a wake up call again, that you see that um, uh, two wake up calls, in fact, first of all, uh, that, yeah, uh, 
the best the best way to really uh, address the epidemic would be uh, to create better vaccines, which have been underfunded for decades. I have a big interest in vaccinology for already a long time, but it's also very complex, so just like aging. Um, but uh, yeah, so the first wake up call was regarding we need uh, more funding for vaccines, um, and perhaps in later instances, uh, um, even vaccines to address senescent cells and so on, aging vaccines, but it's another story. Um, and uh, yeah, and then addressing aging itself because it are mainly elderly people who become very sick of, of this epidemic. I think also we uh, what happened in a year, um, I can quickly address that also, but uh, I think we are being of, of a new biotech revolution um, and that will unfold over many decades. And we are just at the beginning of that new era. And the last year we have seen, again, interesting strides forwards uh, regarding gene editing, transcriptomic drugs, epigenetic drugs, which are going to transform the medical field. Uh, because now as medical doctors, we cannot do a lot to really uh, treat patients. But uh, we see again that this year was a great year for gene editing, for example, with uh, novel ways of CRISPR that uh, are even more accurate and that can uh, yeah, even uh, insert genes uh, in, in more trustworthy ways, more efficient ways. Same for transcriptomic drugs. Uh, we see some nice developments there, uh, improved uh, the machines and um, transcriptomic uh, drugs and so on and delivery vehicles. So, um, and same for epigenetic drugs and so on. So this year was again a fascinating year and it's the beginning of a whole new era, biotech era, uh, and that, that, that won't be counted in years. But uh, again, if you see what happened in, in just 12 months, it's, it's very fascinating. Um, and of course, what I also see is besides this cutting biotech uh, field with all these new biotech uh, pioneering technologies, that are being improved more and more um, is that uh, we see also more a trend of uh, these longevity based nutraceutical companies that are also becoming uh, more and more interesting investors taking more and more these companies serious. A uh, classic example is Elysium, but you have other companies that are uh, in, in uh, let's say, in the making that uh, straddle or, uh, or somewhere between, uh, in fact, uh, pharma and the classic supplement companies, but that use science based uh, supplements to address aging, which have can have a lot of advantages because if you are a pharmaceutical company, aging is not an indication, so you cannot really treat aging while the supplement companies can uh, try to treat aging and they can use combinations while classic pharma is not using combinations yeah. and shy away from it. Uh, and you need combinations of drugs to really make an impact on a very complex thing uh, like aging. So I think that's also an interesting uh, paradigm shift. And I think that's going to bring these anti-aging therapies more to the, uh, to the general audience much faster then all these new biotechnologies that will take yeah, 10, 15 years, perhaps even decades uh, uh, to further uh, develop. Thanks, Chris. And Kate, how did, how did you see the, uh, how did you see last year? Oh, well, first of all, uh, my uh, colleagues brought uh, many excellent points. Uh, so I, I don't want to be redundant, but uh, we also definitely did witness uh, the strength and focus on human health. And we've seen uh, investors uh, coming for, from uh, more traditional fields such as real estate and tourism and investing in biotech. We've seen uh, huge funding rounds. Uh, you know, our group for many years uh, has been publishing uh, open access analytical reports uh, in order to uh, efficiate uh, the, pub the shift in public opinion and uh, bring attention to the importance of human health. So uh, as Chris mentioned, uh, Clearly, uh, the elderly are the, in the highest risk group as a result of pandemic. And we are uh, trying, as amongst of our other projects, to actually capture that moment and say, hey, like, uh, addressing aging is extremely important. And as part of that effort, uh, we've uh, produced a new set of uh, open access analytics, uh, which, devote, which was devoted solely to COVID-19. Uh, if you guys remember, uh, in the past, we've been uh, ranking countries based on the effectiveness of their longevity policies, and there were many uh, factors and metrics involved. So we felt compelled uh, in March of this year to use the same methodology and adjust it to uh, COVID safety of countries. And uh, this resulted in uh, you know, a number of uh, uh, reports that we published and it's actually an ongoing uh, process and thankfully it's received uh, lots of media attention across the globe uh, and we continue this effort uh, keeping uh, the importance of uh, aging research uh, and longevity policy advancement across the globe. Great thanks. I, I, I want to talk in, in a minute about um, James getting back in a minute to you about 
difficulty of raising funds and exits. Um, but Laura, you, you mentioned about, you know, seeing a lot more real companies and, and progress. Um, how should we think about real companies in this space and how should we think about measuring progress? How do you, how do you think about that? Yeah, so first I just want to emphasize that the companies that I focus on are very specific types, so they're, they're not applicable. I, I think Dave and I have a broader perspective on the industry as a whole as regards to pharma. The companies that I focus on are founder-driven, they're stage, they're very ambitious in their concept, so it's a very small subset of the industry. What I can say is we don't see more companies, actually. We're, we're just seeing that the companies that do come to us are much higher quality. The people, so much more ambitious people, I think, are starting companies now, like the best might have seen COVID and said, oh, well, I think I'm going to go work in biotech now because it's like impactful and like, why the heck not? It's a pandemic. Um, and they're also moving a lot faster. So um, I've watched multiple stories this year that just have grown at, I think, probably historical rates, not from a financing perspective, but like from an operations perspective. So like personnel, like rate of turnover of like different, even like experiments or kind of like, um, uh, just sort of like take, take the average time for everything that you normally expect to happen and like compress it by about like half. And that's about the time it's taken for these companies. So I think it just, it, it's a, it's a wonderful time in my very small part of the industry to set benchmarks for pro, for progress that can hopefully extend outside of COVID. It may also be completely unrealistic because you never see these factors combined in any other environment. But I think it's just, it's a really interesting kind of high watermark for uh, rates of, of progress, I think in my small part of the industry. And when we talk about benchmarks, usually we talk about sometimes successful exits or we talk about product approvals. When we talk about benchmarks in this industry, um, Kate, is it, is it different than in the biotech industry? Oh, uh, yes, uh, I believe so. Uh, because as uh, James mentioned, uh, there is a lot of uh, hype in the industry and uh, there is a, you know, uh, Obtaining adequate ROI is difficult. Uh, is more difficult compared to, you know, say traditional biotech. Uh, so uh, at the same time, it's very important uh, to, uh, you know, keep adequate focus uh, and uh, invest wisely. And our approach is to uh, actually uh, have lots of analytical frameworks uh, and databases that help us uh, make investment decisions. Yeah, yeah. I, I would. I would add on slightly that and, and and maybe maybe taking a slightly different perspective than Kate there I, I look at the the benchmarks in this longevity field as almost exactly the same as in the rest of the biotech industry we, we talked about this a little bit in an, an earlier panel at this conference about indication selection and like what the difference was between this longevity industry and the non longevity like traditional biotech industry and my view and certainly uh, the way that, that I've been working with my team at, at Cambrian is kind of along the lines that for the first few years, most of the companies in this longevity industry look exactly like traditional biotech companies. They have an indication that the FDA would normally recognize. They have a team that's doing their medicinal chemistry, their phase one, phase two trials, whatever. Um, and it's only a little bit further in the future after a phase two proof of concept study that we imagine, okay, now this drug can shift to a prevention mechanism or a multi-disease treatment mechanism that differentiates this world from from the rest of the biotech industry. So, so when Laura was talking about like a compression of these timelines and, and the benchmarks, you know, this can mean the same sorts of things that we would look at like in an oncology company, the time from going from, you know, target to hit stage to, for, to the hit to lead stage, the time that it takes for the medicinal, the medicinal chemistry to like get done and advance something to a candidate in IND study. A lot of those timelines are kind of what I see shrinking as as we in this industry run more and more professional companies. So anyway, it's a slightly different perspective. I think Kate's view is, is true for the longevity industry look, looked at as the longevity world, but in my little slice, there is a lot that is trying to cast ourselves as an extension, a natural extension of the standard biotech and pharma industry. Mm -hmm. Understood. Yeah. And if I may actually make an additional point here, uh, because you guys probably know that our definition of longevity industry is much wider compared to many other longevity focused funds, because we don't just include, uh, you know, geroscience, R&D, we also include P4 medicine, we also include age tech and the financial sector here. So essentially it's 
many aspects of human life that have to do with health, right? Uh, so uh, the fact that we include tech and finance, for instance, uh, and let's take age tech as an example, because uh, you have the target group, which is older people, and there's about 1 billion people in retirement globally. Uh, and there are many technologies that can improve older people's lives by virtue of, you know, cognitive enhancement, you know, loneliness, uh, fintech for older people and all that. So you don't need to really reinvent the wheel there because uh, people are here and many technologies are here as well. You just need to pick the best ones. So in that aspect uh, of uh, uh, longevity industry, uh, you know, I think a lot can be done right now. So, mm -hmm. yes, and, and to add also to that, uh, our fund tries to mitigate uh, risk in, in several ways. Um, so, like uh, Kate says, uh, we we look uh, not just at longevity tech, but also med tech, and in fact, we look also at uh, biotech companies and pharma companies that are not treating longevity per se, but that have just pioneering uh, technologies um, that can treat many diseases, including a lot of aging-related diseases. Um, so, uh, so for example, our fund invested in 4DMT, which is developing a novel kind of uh, uh, more successful and effective uh, viral vectors. We also invested in Sigalon, which is a company that uh, encapsulated uh, cell that encapsulates cells that can be injected in the abdominal cavity. Uh, to treat uh, type uh, to uh, diabetes or type 1 diabetes, for example. So these these are companies. They are more, let's say, uh, classic uh, biotech, but pioneering uh, biotech, uh, but not uh, really focused on on aging itself. And that also helps our funds um, to differentiate and, and uh, reduce risk. And also because we invest uh, all, uh, with uh, really um, a background, a good background in aging, and also focusing on aging mechanisms, we automatically reduce risk because uh, technology that addresses aging. Uh, mechanisms um, will probably uh, be more successful in clinical trials because you go to the root cause of diseases uh, like Alzheimer's disease. If uh, a lot of companies fail to uh, spend the billions of dollars into uh, trying to focus on a tiny little uh, protein involved in uh, Alzheimer's disease, but we know it's a typical aging related disease, very complex uh, caused by aging itself. So it's better to go to the root cause of uh, Alzheimer's, which is aging, the aging process itself. Um, so the same for many other diseases. So that also mitigates uh, risk. And, and we also try to focus on the specific hallmarks of aging, but uh, probably um, also impact other hallmarks of aging. For example, if you look at epigenetic reprogramming, we see that uh, that has the potential to uh, mitigate all kinds of other uh, aging hallmarks. Like if you epigenetically reprogram cells, you reduce or uh, other hallmarks like mitochondrial dysfunction, DNA damage, protein accumulation. Um, so, um, and we also try to focus on, on technologies that encompass, that not just focus on a tiny little aspect of aging, uh, because aging is very complex, uh, many mechanisms cause it, and if you just perhaps improve mitochondrial functioning, there is still the problem of protein accumulation, epigenetic dysregulation, uh, telomere shortening, DNA damage. Um, so that's also another way we try to mitigate risk. Chris, at a, high, at, Chris, at, a high, at a very high level, um, most of the capital has flown to companies in the United States in the biotech, in the life sciences industry, um, do you, and, and not to companies in Europe. Do you see a difference in geroscience or longevity in terms of where capital will ultimately flow, the United <laughs> States versus Europe, and it will be different than in the biotech world? Yes, well, our fund is based in the U.S., and we focus yeah. mainly on the U.S. market. Uh, because no, well, I'm, I'm, I'm just talking about generally. Yeah, How do you yeah. see Europe versus the U.S.? Yeah, your... That's uh, also a bit my answer uh, to your question, because we know that in the U.S. there are more opportunities. There's more capital. Uh, there's more, let's say, um, uh, we have the impression there's more uh, research going on in the aging field. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we also see that uh, even big universities uh, and, and so on really make uh, aging one of their priorities. Uh, so they, they realize that if you want to address aging and keep the population even healthy as long as possible, you need to go to the root cause, which is the aging process itself. And that idea, that paradigm shift, uh, seems to live more in the U.S., especially at the top uh, universities like Harvard, uh, Stanford, and so on. Uh, while in Europe, um, it's still um, it's less. There's less capital. There is less the realization that uh, uh, the best way to keep uh, population healthy is is by going to uh, root cause, which is aging itself. Let's try, yeah. So so let's let's try to go through some questions kind of quickly um, for the audience. Um, is it harder to raise a longevity fund or a biotech fund? Kate? 
Well, uh, I think longevity is harder. Again, because, uh, it's uh, a relatively newly coined terms. Uh, unfortunately, there were some failures in terms of uh, longevity companies this year. Uh, there is some hype there, definitely. Our approach here is to actually, you know, we embrace our broader definition of longevity yeah. industry and we diversify the portfolio by adding something that, you know, can be, you know, Got as good prof as, pos as possible, including age tech and financial industry, for instance, James, and preventive James, medicine. Got it. James, what do you think? What's harder to raise, longevity fund or biotech fund? The stage is very important here. I think that it is it has shown to be remarkably easy to take the topic of longevity and raise a few million dollars from investors here and there. Uh, I think that's kind of the the trading on the hype aspect of it. The transition that I'm, I'm sure Laura can expand on because a few of her companies have successfully made this this transition is like from the seeding stage as you move into the you know into the clinical trial stage with these therapeutic assets. You're talking about rounds of 50 million, 60 million plus. And that means capturing not just hype, but but much more, you know, feet on the ground types of capital. And and in that scenario, I would probably rather be a specialty oncology or a rare disease company than someone that's just trying to pitch, you know, oh, well, we're going to use medicines to prevent all diseases in the future. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big reason that we positioned each of our assets as like, you know, this is our specialty oncology asset that could become a Jero protector. This is our rare disease asset that could become a Jero protector. Because as we move into the that next stage, you know, we're going to have to raise or to put capital behind those, those assets in our pipeline, as if, you know, if, Based, based on the first indications that they're going to go after and and the aging part is really in the back of our minds not Laura, what, not Laura what do you think Laura what do you think which one's what's harder to raise actually uh, oh, in terms of what's harder to raise I would have no idea for biotech. I've never raised a biotech fund I've only ever raised longevity funds so I'm not yeah, but what do you think what do you think um, but but I'd say for um, the larger 60 100 million dollar rounds I think still actually they are being raised in part on hype where you're seeing kind of like major investors um, kind, of like, kind of like um SPVs by smaller investors being organized to lead the rounds and then like large chunk investors coming in behind but like I'd say most of the companies that are very ambitious in their claims are not raising for specialty because James your point it's correct like they just can't if they don't specialize assets yet. I think the pitch is that like once they run this critical trial then the other capital can come in but like to get past the POC trial some of these companies are still looking to um, I'd say like less biotech specific capital more kind of like mission oriented capital to get past the critical POC um, and it's, it's unclear that's a good idea or not like, it could be that you want a high diligence bar at that point and like it's bad to have like a sort of less um, focused round but I, I do think the upside is that if you have a very fun driven company with like a very new unique mission that's not looking like a traditional bio company I just think that's going to get killed completely by any other kind of capital and so it's kind of like a, I think an only kind of um, path forward for some of these companies that really want to keep this um, different way of describing themselves. Yeah, and, and, and James, un understanding there's different uh, uh, stages of when you can invest, but if you were a sophisticated, if you were um, uh, a sophisticated endowment, um, what, what rate of return should you expect if you were investing in a longevity fund? So versus a biotech fund and Kate, yeah. what do you, or James, you can start it, you know, higher, lower and what numbers, can you put some numbers on it if you can? So, so I've had, uh, I had the opportunity back when I was a VC, which is kind of like now I've switched sides um, a little bit and I'm sitting as a kind of VC, but mostly as a CEO of a, of a multi-asset company. Um, but I had the opportunity to talk to a number of pension funds, big big like risk management firms and so on. And the the mark that they set themselves to is a risk adjusted 25% IRR, right? 25% internal rate of return, 30 for the really good firms. That's like top quartile, maybe, I don't know, Laura, you probably know better, top quintile biotech performance. And, and so from an expectation standpoint for an investor like that, those folks are generally as much as they might agree with the mission, they're going to be motivated by their financial bottom line. And they would hold me to the same standards as they would hold Third Rock or any of their other, you know, Venbio or any of their biotech investment, bi biotech fund investments. And so 
um, that's th that's I okay. think the All right. you're you're at twenty five percent. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Laura, Laura, what do you think? What do you think a, a sophisticated investor is looking for if they invest in a longevity fund? <laughs> well, I, I don't disagree with James on the return benchmark. Um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it. You leave it twenty five. Chris, what do you think? Sorry, yes. Um, well, I, I think it will become more and more easier um, um, to make uh, investors enthusiastic about longevity funds because more and more people uh, will start to realize uh, that you need to address aging, uh, the, the, the root cause of so many aging related diseases. Um, also, everyone wants to stay healthy and young. So it's like uh, we've been looking for thousands of years uh, to technologies to um, um, yeah, slow down the aging process. No. So, what, so, so, what, so if you were an investor, what return would you want if, if somebody were investing in, in a longevity fund? What kind of rate of return? Yeah, well, I, I think, uh, but also James said uh, that was, a, I think it's a realistic return at 20, 25%. Yep. Uh, it Kate, all depends, of course. Kate, what do you think? Uh, I don't disagree. Uh, and again, our approach, as I uh, mentioned earlier, is uh, slightly different and it's wider, wider. We cannot ignore the fact that aging is extremely complex biological process. Uh, but then, you know, if we include other sectors there, especially, you know, uh, preventive medicine, you know, the age stack, uh, I think it's possible to balance out the portfolio and uh, render reasonable returns. Is it possible, do you mind if I just interject and maybe bring it back to a point that was raised early in the discussion that I'm actually kind of curious to discuss with the panelists because I've changed my mind on this in the past year, but I'm, I'm not sure that I'm, I'm right. It's just sort of like a, a, a new conviction, which is basically, I, I think like when we started Longevity Fund in 2011, basically I was like, I know nothing about biotech investing. We have to be as conservative as possible. We have to make companies that look like any other company, they have to look really the same and they have to be invested by the same good biotech investors, the same cabal that like invest in, you know, a small set of companies that go on to do well or self-funded to do well investors later um, and basically if you look at our fund one portfolio it's, it's that it's mostly companies that are pretty conservative in terms of mechanism they're as conservative as you can get um, they're funded by people who have already started many other types of companies not longevity focused and they mostly don't call themselves longevity companies they call themselves like disease oriented companies um, but I, I think like in the past year I've gotten a new conviction that actually we should be more ambitious as a field that we should start funding companies that like call themselves any companies that, that, that not every investor should do this, that like there should maybe be like 5% of all companies funded per year that are this ambitious, but like there should be a few companies that are legitimately trying to solve one going after that indication directly. Um, and that it's kind of, it, it, it's, a, it's a different, it's more risky, but that we're doing ourselves a disservice by kind of shying away from that. Um, and, and so maybe, James, maybe, maybe like just a small percentage, but that's one thing. And then also I think we're doing ourselves a disservice as a field by focusing really on the hallmarks of aging. Like I think they're great to explain to like non-technical investors how the space might be organized, but they're not reflective of like the real biology of aging, which is mostly unknown. And so like it, we really need some more like non-conservative, completely novel, that sort of left field from different areas that are not longevity focused, that are sort of surprisingly relevant to the field. So sorry, those are, those are just two okay. things that I don't Let's pick, up, let's pick up on that, Laura. Yes, yes, no answers. Were too many are too many companies getting funded in the space, Kate? I don't think so. James? Yes. <laughs> Chris? Well, um, uh, yes, 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 no. Yeah, too, many say, too many companies getting funded? No, if it's a good company that really makes a chance of really impacting aging, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, yes. <laughs> much funding if it's our bad companies or companies that um, you can all look uh, you can already see that they probably will fail because of, of yeah the way they address these aging mechanisms so Thank nice example, by the way I, I just saw the question calico versus unity from uh, the audience i think if you look at how unity uh, uh, try to address senescent cells you could already already so, sort of predict that this, this was not going to work very we're, well we're gonna, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna get to that in a second the, the okay. question is, are we funding too many companies right now? Yes or no? Your answer is yes. Not enough. I think we need to. Not uh, enough. You want to fund more companies? Yes. That's, that's the best way to keep everyone else healthy as long as possible. <laughs> okay. L Laura, do you think we're funding too many companies? We're funding too many bad companies and not enough good ones. Funding too many bad ones and not enough good ones. Yeah. Okay. And that, now let's get to the Calico unit. So one of the um, hallmarks uh, in, 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 uh, uh, you know, one of the reasons biotech has done so well is there's been a lot of exits, people have made money, that kind of thing. We saw a couple of high, 
high um, profile setbacks this year, you know, Unity or Calico, uh, are those setbacks, public setbacks, um, going to uh, affect the industry in any substantial way um, next year? Mm -hmm. Laura, what do you think? Um, it's a question. I, again, I'm very specialized for my subset. I think it's had basically no effect. Anybody who like understands drug development doesn't expect complete success of all of all strategies. Um, and most people, I think, were fairly like questionable about Calco. But yeah, it's a, for my subset, no. But like it might for the broader change. Yeah, I I can jump in here to say, um, so. This has actually been, you know, I think there's been Unity and there's been Restore, which were Restore, two of the right, big, right. yeah, right. two of the big trials that that right. many of us were looking at, which uh, both failed to meet their endpoints and in, in trials this year. Um, but to me, this was these were really like first volleys on goal of a bigger industry, right? And and so when I've talked to investors, both sophisticated and smart but less biotech focused investors um the message that i've said is you know kind of to laura's point if if we're going to take real shots on goal at this overall aging field it's going to have to be with a scale and with a set of like with a diversified set of approaches that we are going to have to build institutions that can absorb one or two or three failures but that's true of any field of biotech right the whole immuno oncology industry was hit with failure after failure after failure until like the beginning of this last decade when all of a sudden things started to work we figured out how to do the trials in the right way and then we saw this whole string of successes and and i think longevity is not going to be too different so like to to laura's earlier point about like how to take the big shots on goal versus like building little you know biotech companies that can attract uh the expert the expert investors to them. I've also moved away from that model a little bit because that was my initial model too, right? I brought some some big VCs into one of the first companies that I started. And, and I've moved back away from that to try to take a slightly different approach, which is to still fund specific programs, but do it all through a single vehicle, right? So that we have just one company at the top level, that's Cambrian, and then we can build our individual pipeline of drugs towards specific topics at the the asset level but the rolled up version of this multi-asset approach is this bigger vision where we can collect data and and build capabilities that are specific to the geroscience space across all of those assets mm -hmm. yes yes and i also sophisticated investors the setbacks we have seen this year won't uh, put them off uh, because uh, for 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 example restore bio uh, if you look at their trial they, they, they try to focus on these uh, upper respiratory tract uh, infections and so on it's very difficult to really measure that in a, in a trial um, so there, there are so many confounding factors that can impact whether elderly people uh, will have uh, a respiratory uh, respiratory upper tract infection so it's very difficult to measure these outcomes and uh, so many things can confound these outcomes so uh, perhaps Restore Bio has some other pipelines uh, and uh, hopefully they, these will be successful. Probably they will be easier to measure like Parkinson's disease, which is still also difficult to um, a lot of drugs fail in the neurodegenerative space because it's also so difficult to measure cognition or even uh, the problems uh, as you see with Parkinson's disease, but still probably uh, more, uh, let's say, um, uh, I have more hope for, for, for that, uh, but remains to be seen. Um, the same with Unity. Um, if you look at the way they address the, the senescent cells, uh, there is a lot of side effects, and uh, the question is whether they can really uh, address the senescent cells and, and, and so on um, sufficiently. But we, we have to see, but I think for sophisticated investors, uh, uh, the, these won't be setbacks, and uh, perhaps ironically, uh, people will be spurred on and uh, realize more the potential of uh, the longevity field uh, through their pets. Uh, if we see uh, rejuvenation happening uh, in, in the pets that people yeah, have in their yeah, pets, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, as we look forward to next year, um, Kate, what's the one, what, what, what's, what is the one or two things the industry can do or, or we'll see that will attract? all the biotech capital, start to attract some of the biotech capital and move it into uh, the longevity or geroscience field. Okay, well, I can add my two cents here and it has to do with the projects that we're involved. Uh, so um, one of the uh, 
things we're working on is a project called Longevity Card, and it's a fintech project. And essentially, its slogan is uh, health is the new wealth, and it promotes a healthy behavior of its holders. So let's say if you have a card uh, and you log in your encrypted uh, health data, as well as, uh, you know, log in certain you know health activities that you have per day you get rewarded uh, including with personalized medical and financial advice so it's, it is designed for people who want to live a uh, long healthy life and be financially stable so that's something that what we are up to uh, so uh, we are also very big believers in preventive medicine measures uh, as well as applying ai to precision medicine data but that's our point you know i'm very curious to hear the opinion of my and, colleagues and, and, here and, and you think those projects are going to help uh, uh, pull some of the capital away from biotech into into this space well it has to do with human health and uh, there's a you know there's a lot of uh, there's room for improvement. Okay. Uh, so uh, my answer is okay. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Laura, what, what, what do you think? What's the one thing the industry has to do to pull this capital away from biotech? Yeah. So my quick answer is uh, Bob Nelson and Arch started Excel a decade, I think, before Juno. And basically it was the same idea and it failed because, like James said, we didn't understand how to do these things yet. And then with Juno, kind of the same idea with a decade of experience and thought worked and then everyone else followed. And so what I think we're trying to do long field right now is have our first Juno, have our first major success, not just financially, but clinically. And we believe that that will pull everyone else in um, as rational actors. Yep. And, 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 and when do you think, uh, what, what, in your mind, what's the timeline for the first major clinical success that we're going to see? So we're, we're focused in the next decade on seeing like the first clinical proof of concept of an aging drug working in people, ideally uh, for an aging specific indication, not just an age-related disease, um, like, but in the next decade. And I think that's one of the most cool things that's going to happen in the next decade if it does. So you think, it's, you think we're still a decade away? Uh, I think for an indication, it could be a lot sooner. I think for something that is actually aging relevant, it's definitely going to be on the order of a decade. Um, but it's a very ambitious goal, to be clear. Yeah, yeah. James, what yeah. do you think? How, how, how do you think the industry is going to pull money away from biotech? So, so I completely agree with Laura's prediction there that this aging field, like the big fulcrum point, happens in, I've said, 7 to 12 years, right? So right about that decade uh, range depending on how fast we are and how well we use data to accelerate these kind of clinical trials. And so because of those very long timelines, I tend to be more subversive about the aging, uh, the aging angle here, right? And so that's a little bit why <clears throat> my take on this is not to build the next Juno, so to say, but the next, uh, the next bridge bio, right? Where, where Bridge is this like multi-asset R&D shop that's taking all of these different approaches with the same kind of unified theme, but each individual asset can like be cultivated from a really early stage and generate its own value that way. And then the, the, like, the question that I think is most interesting facing the industry is like, who's going to be doing the work to catalyze that seven to 10 year goal? Yeah. Um, oh, and, yeah. and to me, that's the race of like, who can be, yeah. who can be the first to wield that multi-billion, uh, those multi-billion dollar checks or create the collaborations that can wield those multi-billion dollar checks to, to lay the found work, the foundation for that. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I, I was hoping we had two minutes left. We only have one minute left. Um, so Chris, I guess, why don't we go with you? One, one, hey, 30 seconds now. What's, what's the industry have to do to pull money away from biotech and pull it into the industry? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's often all a question of money. So uh, if they can develop a, a drug that really targets aging, um, that can uh, target a very prevalent disease many people are fearful from, like heart disease and Alzheimer's. When, when, when is that, that going to happen? Um, well, I think in the next five to ten years, probably a small molecule uh, that uh, uh, probably perhaps a combination of uh, small molecules that really target. You're, 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 you think it's five to ten years? Yeah, well, I think, okay. yes. Uh, okay. And Kate, Kate, what do you think in terms of uh, drugs? Just quickly. So far, we have seven to twelve a decade, five to ten. Kate? Well, you know, we're big believers what? in AI. So, uh, and uh, if you... Uh, but we, uh, we only have... Uh, de depending, okay, well, depending on the model you use, it could be less than 10 years. Uh, so, but. Okay, okay, so yeah. we, got, we got a range of time frame. Okay.
Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for the panel. It felt a little bit like the lightning round in the last few minutes, but I really appreciate it <laughs> keeping to the, uh, the schedule. I'll just make one quick comment about Dennis's last question about the time frames. I understand the rationales behind why for the big win, for the big longevity indication, it could take uh, a long time, a decade. It'd be interesting to see when Jim Mellon comes in with his various models and with the Chinese money, uh, with the uh, um, Alex Zavronkov and so forth, whether they're thinking about a shorter time frame or a different sector perhaps of the way they're looking at the markets. But this is a conversation that's going to continue for sure. So thank you so much, panel.